Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Myth and Meaning, the show where your hosts, on the left, Owl, and on the right, Brock, go through mythological tales and the significance therein. Today, as usual, we're talking about Dragon Ball, and in particular, we're talking about Oolong, the simp, as you might be able to tell. Oh yeah, I think you can tell just from this first frame. I cannot, actually. I need some explanation behind this picture, Brock, if you care to uh, expound. So you can see a certain representation of the snake that's actually pretty common is showing the snake as a woman. And that snake woman generally... Oh, we good? Generally um, is the representation of Lilith, sort of the dark half of Eve, right? So whenever you look at what Eve represents in the fall, the the bad aspects of that, you know, the whatever could be construed as the negative aspects of that are sort of represented by Lilith. And you see here the temptation of that, uh, you could say, negative woman aspect is something that you see manifest in simps, you could say. Oh, I see. In this instance, you're, you're implying that Adam is a simp in this image because he is looking towards Lilith instead of Eve? Right. Oh, the I snake. see. Let me tie that together. <laughs> yeah, uh, right, the snake. And it co can come in many forms, masculine and feminine. In this case, yeah. The thought is a device of Satan. Yes. Definitely in, in the way that we're seeing it represented here. And I mean, just the that mode of being, right? The being a thought, you can think of, well, what did Bluma just do? She revealed herself to the sight of the blind king. She is revealing herself to what the blind king represents. And by doing so, has become the archetype of the thought you could say well because she's she is a thought because she has succumbed to her um the spirit the self man it's it's hard to explain let's say the the cane like spirit that she embodied in the last couple of episodes right she didn't make the right type of sacrifice to get what she wanted but she still thinks, regardless, that she's still the most valuable, much like a thought. Yes. Yes. No. That's pretty much my explanation of using that image. Right, and we go from the thought to the simp, which is Oolong. Oolong is the original simp in Dragon Ball. I don't know if there will be more iterations of simps. We will see. But we just briefly wanted to talk about Oolong's design. So um, Toriyama is not a big fan of communists and so decided to have this image of a communist pig be in his his manga. Now, I also wanted to mention that the first in, the first encounter that the priest and monkey have in Journey to the West, uh, Piggy, is also a pig-like creature with superhuman strength who marries a local uh, farmer but eats all their food. He works for them, but he, he devours more than he, he, he reaps, let's say. And so um, basically in that story, Monkey challenges him, beats him, and they travel off together. Uh, s somewhat like what Goku does here, except in this instance, it's not, um, Piggy is not the same character. There's a big difference between Oolong and it's, Piggy. It's really interesting. And we're going to see. Yeah. I don't know if you'd heard that. Well, I, I know a little bit of that. It's really interesting because in the same way that you could say Piggy is sort of holding this, this household hostage, the situation that we find Oolong in it is just an escalation of that. It's like a delineation. Like, let me explain that idea in a way that makes sense to you, right? Let's take it on a societal level. He is holding the village hostage with his behavior, and his behavior isn't depicted the same either. Well, yeah, I mean, um, Oolong doesn't work, right? Oolong isn't, isn't 
eating more than he's bringing in. He's just not bringing in anything. Right. But it's it's more than that, and it's worse than that. We're going to see in, in the episode, um, in this episode, how, how that ends up. But just briefly to talk on his design, uh, he is a communist pig. Yeah. A shape-shifting, dirty communist pig. Well, I like this sort of design that's... Um, you know, well, I guess we can talk about his shape shifting right after this too, because it really ties into he's not only is he a communist pig, but he's a literal interpretation of that ideological structure as a shape shifter. Oh, exactly. Reign of terror as well. Let's we'll get into that. Oh yeah. But before we do, we gotta uh, acknowledge um, our interlude here with Bluma and her seeking of the Dragon Ball. So we know that Goku and Bluma arrive at this town, right, seeking the Dragon Ball, and that's actually why they encounter Oolong in the first place. Um, but the the gaze here towards the treasure, I put some pictures in here to illustrate kind of those, those goal-oriented pathways. And so the first one there is the dragon with the treasure which is a classic uh it, it's almost a symbol at this point um for the salvation of your own community right i mean you know it's that pattern of the dragon reward right the dragon ball the dragon thing that you're seeking well i also think that um it's it's i put this picture significantly because it is you get you defeat as jordan peterson says you defeat the dragon, get the gold, and take it back to share with your community. And that's exactly <coughs> what happens in this episode. Right. And it's the community that actually gets saved, not just Bulma's desires. Mm -hmm. But it's not because of Bulma, obviously. Uh, but then I also put this other one down here. Um, it's a celebration from the Phantom Menace. And I put that because it is the community coming together after having that enlightenment bestowed upon them. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about that aspect of it. I mean, I haven't put much of a, an analysis onto the prequels, but I'm sure there's something to say about them. Oh, no, it's just this is just an image. I mean, I mean no. no, because this this orb isn't anything. It's never in the movie before this. My, my, if this orb was like the thing they were fighting over the whole time. Then we can make an argument about that, but no, I, I don't think so. Maybe like on April 1st, we could do an episode about the prequels. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a dragon that they need to confront, and the this uh, oolong creature, the village tells them, is uh, a shape-shifting uh, monster that can, that can easily destroy the town if he wished but always asks for young girls and instead. Right, keeps continually kidnapping the young girl. Why young girls? Why do you think? Well, it's because that is the future of the species, and it would be, let's say, for... It's a couple of different reasons. For Oolong, it's because he is a simp. He's desirous of female companionship without putting in the effort to better oneself to have that. Right. He he is looking for the immature feminine. Right. That's Oolong side. But for the story story side in general, he's taking young women because that is the cornerstone of the the future of the society. A society of no women has no future. Right. And we had talked about the dragon, but that's the thing that the dragon does when it's stealing the uh i mean the princess or just the maiden well the in exactly yeah that's that's the symbology of it is yeah. it's the future of your community is at stake if monsters are allowed to exist if chaos is not kept at bay and this this is exactly uh the monster here oolong and he's seeking out uh women and i think i put this one because it shows he both looks at bluma and he looks at goku dressed as a girl yeah, he, it's, he's represented as this scary monster, but he is also able, I wanted to get a picture of him as the sort of handsome man, because he's a monster that can uh, 
that can attract women, that can sort of portray himself as having a virtue, you could say, for the women. He could signal his virtue that way as a shape-shifting communist. Right, but he the the only way, much like a communist, he's able to gain actual power is through a reign of terror. Exactly. And so in this reign of terror, he's able to get all he wants, and he meets our dragon crew. However, Goku standing up to him, much like what we were talking about, um, communists and uh, revolutions in general that have started, uh, come with the inspiration of a single person. And Goku standing up to him inspires the village to stand up. And the reason I put this picture of, I don't know if you know what this is. I don't. This is the Battle of Stamford Bridge. It's the last Viking mm. incursion into England. And it had one, uh, there he is, one Viking axeman, a uh, berserker standing there, just holding the line, killing hundreds, well, maybe not hundreds, hold, maybe, I don't know, a hundred man slayer. Possibly. Uh, killing many, many English uh, before he was finally felled. Uh, they stuck uh, spears up through the top to kill him. They couldn't actually kill him from the front. He, there's only three people at a time. You just mow him down. But the reason I put that is because he inspired uh, his people to fight even against odds that seemed impossible and actually were impossible. They lost. But uh, much like Goku inspires the village here to stand up to what they would think is an impossible task. Right. And it's important that it's that it comes down to this situation where the young men are standing up to it, right? For the virtue of the young women, right? It's the the potential of the masculine in society saving the potential of the feminine and, and you know, the key to con the, the, the continuation of your society, right? It has to come through that to defeat something it's as not the old pernicious standing as a, up. As pernicious as a shapeshifter, right? Right. Yeah. So just one defeat isn't enough. It has to be a systemic defeat, really, to defeat it. And so there, uh, once being found out... Wait, did I skip the slide? No. Once being found out, I think, though... No, no, I know where we're getting to here. So not to... I mean, we're, we can just skip ahead. Basically, we know the, the outline of what happens next. Goku right. challenges Oolong. Oolong runs away. And this is what happens when Oolong runs away. Right. Well, he is running. He is trying to outrun the Nimbus. Right. So whenever he's stood up to, he can't He can't deal with that. He, he flees. Right. Right. Because when, when um, let's say, the spirit that inhabits Oolong, this communist deceit um, that he portrays, when that is challenged by uh, someone who is in, embodying the Holy Trinity walking with God, um, he stands no chance. So he know, and he knows that. So he runs and he tries to run from, and I'll let you go from there. The Nimbus. What the Nimbus represents, it's sort of that way of Tao. The he's trying not to acknowledge that he needs to be able to get on the on the path, right? And he thinks that he can shape shift his way into a mode of being that's better than that. And he can't. So obviously the Nimbus catches up to him and need, and he needs to be saved by the Nimbus, actually. Because he gets does he get too tired? He can't oh he can't stay transformed for too long. He can't stay That's transformed right. for too long because and we'll figure out uh the reason later, but it's because of a, a flaw in his character. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And and so Because he's a soup. And so since he can't sustain it. He needs to be saved ultimately by the Nimbus. He needs to be put on the path by Goku. Here, yes, put literally. Here's your path, and Goku. Goku saves him, and they then go to rescue the young women who were kidnapped. And we can see it here. He's offered them um, just lavish accommodations, lets them do whatever uh, they want. He waits upon them, and. He actually doesn't get anything out of it. I wonder where I've heard that before. This is the pitiful nature of being a simp, where all of this shape-shifting and virtue signaling ultimately leads you to give yourself away and not really be substantial at all. 
And as we can see, he was insubstantial. Ultimately, uh, neither his rocket nor his giant robot form were able to stand up to our dragon crew in the spirit that Goku embodies, for the most part. Bluma does have some uh, redeeming qualities in her adventurous spirit. However, um, a lot of that modesty has been thrown to the wayside for now. Right, and, and this is a, that's a good time to bring up that this is exactly following Bulma and her situation, where she is as a character, because Oolong is inextricably tied to Bulma. Well, now he is, for sure, mm -hmm. because we have the quintessential thought, abandoned from paradise, and... And what the thought manifests. And here's the manifestation, exactly. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's crazy to me to think of it that way and not have noticed it whenever I first watched it, right? That connection between the two. But once you see it, it's like, yeah, of course. Of course they have this relationship to each other because it's a, it's a mirror. Oh, yeah. It's, it's the... Um, it's that un... And, and to be specific, what, what this relationship is, is the unrequited... Um, affections towards the simp from the thought to gain monetary or uh, resources otherwise from said simp. And that behavior not only is outlined here before the internet, but it's damnation um, is the next thing we're going to be able to see. But before that, I think, I think Brock's going to take it away here. Not for too long, but there is this this idea that I want to bring up here, and we're going to come back around to it as we talk about Yamcha as well, um, that is Jungian in nature. So Jungian's image of the self, of, of you, right, is that you have an equal and, well, not equal, I should say. Um, you have a greater than equal opposite that is your shadow. And on the far end of your shadow is your opposite sex, representation that is a persona that you carry inside of yourself and so for a woman it would be her animus and for a man it's the anima and so looking at this through the Jungian lens you can see that there is this projection of Bulma's animus into what Oolong is the masculine aspect of Bulma right and, and it's not exactly that it's not a one-to-one -one parallel to the animus but it's more along the lines of this is a projection of Bulma's unintegrated animus, what she understands to be the proper well, masculine what way. what she disintegrated. She disintegrated yes. that by her actions, by the corrupt bargain that started off her character arc, basically. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't want to say that Oolong is her animus. Oolong is a manifestation built of the upon disintegration the fact that she is animus. disintegrated. Yes. So he is sort of the... He is the fool of the animus, so to speak. Hmm. Well, he will serve a foolish purpose here, too. Um, but right, and we see this uh, picture on the left here with the panties on. Um, something something foolish that Bluma would not approve of. Oh, yeah. But uh, then, after we see them rescue, they rescue the town... Um, and they start traveling together, uh, despite Oolong's protests. Well, Goku Bulma keeps him on the path. Well, Bulma says specifically that she thinks that he would be useful on their path. Yeah. Well, that's another. Come along, simp. Yeah. I mean, that mode of being can serve me, right? Let it serve. Come on, Goku. Enforce my will. So he's not. He's not too enthusiastic about being dragged along as a puppet for them. So pretty much at the first chance, whenever they're on water, sailing on, not sailing, but boating on the water to get to the next Dragon Ball, he decides that he's out. He's like, I'm not going to be your tool. I'm not going to serve you, actually. And he turns into a fish and tries to swim down away from them. And Goku actually can't catch him. Now, this is interesting. Tying back into the alchemy, right? where Goku always, as we've seen so far, is able to, to get the fish. He just attracts the fish to him, right? But Oolong is, is manifest as a red fish, right? He's All the other fish are, you know, fish-colored, blue-green sort of, right? 
So this is a negative fish. This is the an idea that swims away from Goku and that he can't catch. And so Bulma has to lure this negative fish and out how, of the water. How does she lure it? With her panties. The thing that she lost. Her false modesty. That's right. And I think uh it's it is significant that she she knows as well that to attract that shadow right she has to indulge in it yes she has to pretend not really pretend in a meta way pretend that she has the virtue that she does not have in order to keep manifesting this negative thought from within this negative persona from within you could say right because i had likened fish to sort of the thought coming from god right the thing coming from the unconscious. Well, this is a red fish. This is a negative that goes manifestation into the from her unconscious that wants to swim back down into the unconscious, and she has to keep bringing it back now so it can serve her. Right, and it doesn't like that relationship. No. In fact, you could say God doesn't like that relationship. Oh, yeah. that That's the onus of all of this because now— And it's true. God doesn't like it. Bulma says, well, I need to do something to keep you with us so we don't have to keep trying to bring you back with me having to keep on showing my false modesty and, and virtue signal myself at you. And she's using a thing that she feeds him. It, it actually differs between the English and Japanese translations of this, where I think in it's Japanese, a candy it's, in Japanese, it's a candy. And then in English, it's a, a, a vitamin. Or maybe it's vice versa. I don't remember. But either way, she she gives him something of value. And once he eats it, she is able to call Piggy Piggy. And he has to run, use the bathroom. This is significant because there's a correlation between having to use the bathroom and really revealing your vulnerability. It's a It's a thing that Goku doesn't care about doing, right? Because he'll just drop trowel and piss wherever. But Oolong is very shamed by it, by showing his vulnerability. Why do you think that is? And most people are. Um, Goku isn't shamed because he takes himself lightly. Like an angel. Now, Oolong uh, doesn't take himself lightly. He takes himself seriously, for the most part. Um, in, in fact, later on, I would say in later seasons, he probably takes himself way more lightly than in the first one. But uh, in this one, he definitely has a degree of self-importance and uh, self-indulgence. And I think in, in Japanese, that's why it's a candy, because Bluma knows that not only is it given by her, but it is something that he would want just because he's gluttonous, right? It plays to his faults. And Bluma knows that. Like I said, Bluma's Bluma's knowledgeable of the shadow. More knowledgeable than Goku. Oh, yeah. It, this doesn't register to Goku, right? Because Goku doesn't have to really tackle this shadow aspect of himself because he's integrated, right? He he just is along for the ride, also shaming Oolong and just being like, okay. And so how do how do these thoughts, how do some of these thoughts control their simps? They shame them. Why don't you give me more money? You could afford to give me more money. Oh, yeah. And it's the ultimate embarrassment, right? And so that's exactly what this thought does to Oolong. And because of that, she loses her divine gifts, her ancestral gifts. She loses the capsules. She loses some of her potential. And the reason I put this picture here is because it reminds me of the book Les Miserables about and, and in that book one of the themes at the end and they basically spell it out is that um to love another person unconditionally is to be able to see God, right? And in this it's the exact opposite of that. To see a person as only a tool is to embody Satan. It's to love yourself. Yeah. And that's exactly what we see here. And that's why she loses that is because now it's complete. She's fully embodied the Lil Lilithian path. Right. The negative feminine archetype. 
Not to say she can't be redeemed because she might be. We'll see. But that's where we're that's where we're at. And uh, that actually brings us to the end of this Oolong episode. I think we covered pretty much everything about Oolong here that we need to establish. Yeah, I think this is a good introduction to what Oolong's character really is in the mythos of Dragon Ball. Anything you want to say in closing? Let me check my notes. I just uh, I want to say that we're going from here into the desert. So if you know what the archetype of that is, then you know where this is heading. And there's a reason why we go into the desert right after this. Yeah. Notice the lush greenery around. Bluma has critically screwed up, let's say. Yes. Definitely. But yeah, that's all I've got to say on it. Well, great. If you like what you heard, please subscribe and give us a like. Um, we are going to continue doing these episodes. We're probably going to shift uh, to a more, uh, for our live streams, we're going to shift to a more aiming for Friday um, schedule. I know we didn't do one on Sunday, but don't worry. We're going to continue doing them at, at some point. We just yeah, gotta we're still going to try to get them weekly. Yeah. And um, we're obviously going to continue releasing episodes on Tuesday. So if you're watching this on a Tuesday... Welcome to the premiere. I'm your host on the left, Owl. I'm your host on the right, Brock. And thanks for listening.